If you sign up for a lightning talk, would you please queue here on the side of the, oh, sorry, this side, <laughs> the other side uh, of the, the, the podium uh, situation here, please. Uh, so first we have Mia from Paivo Meetup. So if Mia is around, please join us. Perfect. So the order of all the talks, so we have first Mia from Paivo Meetup. Um, then we have a tournament. Um, then we have Chuck with why would you sh why you should come to CRA panel tomorrow. Uh, then we have AWS Lambda loves Python 3.11. Um, <laughs> Mia, a wonderful, awesome. So Mia is here. We still have three minutes. If you wanna, do you need to prepare? No, no. I don't need any slides. <laughs> okay. You're born ready. Okay. Very good. So hello, everyone, one more time. Uh, is there anyone that wasn't at the opening session? Raise your hand. OK, so a lot of people. So I'm Mia. I'm co-organizer of Prague Python Meetups. In Prague, we have uh, Python Meetups that have been going on for more than 10 years. And these Meetups are every Wednesday in the month. And today is. No, every third Wednesday in a month, and today is the third Wednesday in a month, which means we have a meetup. So our meetup is 10 minutes on food from here. Uh, if you open the EuroPython website uh, and uh, you click on events, you will see their Pivo Wednesday meetup. Uh, we will have a group of people going from here, and so you can uh, join Honza. Honza will be standing in front of the venue. When, Honza? Yes. After yes? The over. After the lightning talks are over, so you can go with him, or you can, uh, you can come at any time. The meetup starts at 7. Uh, there will be some food there, some light snacks, and some smaller, smaller things. But in case if you're very hungry, if you want something big, it's better to go somewhere before the meetup. Is that everything? Yeah, and uh, you can check the maps, but also we'll, uh, sorry, we will put the signs on, so just follow the signs or follow Hansa. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Mia. Now we have a tournament talk. Awesome, I'm starting the Dun, dun, dun. So just a reminder, when you come to the to, when you come to speak, please have your presentations ready to go. Wonderful. You may start. Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Neil. I'm the AI tournament guy. So if you uh, weren't at the opening session, uh, basically I've created a little video game that is meant to be played by a Python program rather than a human. And during the conference, I want, uh, well, you guys can participate in a tournament that will be held on Friday, so you have three days or two and a half to write a little bot that will play this game. Um, I can't handle like 200 bots at the same time on the game, so Please team up with people so that we keep the number of teams playing to a minimum. Uh, so I think I will just show you what the game is um, so you can get an idea. And I hope this doesn't crash. Uh, so what happens is everybody starts with one base on a map and your mining resources. And with those resources, eventually you start building vehicles. You can build some tanks or some uh, boats eventually. Uh, with boats you can make new bases and then you can build planes and you have to basically try to conquer the space. Um, yeah. And if you go to that QR code, you'll get to here with some instructions. So if you want to participate, um, you have to fill in a Google form to sign up with your team name and some GitHub uh, usernames you'll be given a private GitHub repository where you can code your little program. 
uh, read the game rules and start working on your bot. You can do that even before you get to a repository. Uh, there's a forum on the Discord where you can ask me questions. Um, creating alliances with other teams is allowed. Uh, betrayals are also allowed, so be careful. Um, and the deadline is 3 o'clock on Friday, and we'll do the, open, the tournament in the open space uh, on Friday afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Next we have Chuck. Welcome. Yeah. I hope it works. Oh, sorry. Does it work? Oh, do I allow? I allow, but my mouse is gone for some reason. Why is it? Can you see? No? Oh, we can see it now. Okay. Oh, geez. Oh, geez. What's, what's going on? <laughs> no. Ah, I know why. Okay, no, close this. And then, what I can do is just drag it over. No, Jesus. Uh, okay, display, display. Well, don't look at my PRs. Uh. <laughs> uh, is Joshua around? Joshua! <laughs> Wonderful, yes, you're on the queue, very good. Um, oh, he's there. Okay. And then Rodrigo. Amazing, so Chuck. Yes. Okay, so five minutes. Okay, uh, so uh, this is actually the answer of the question why you should come to the PR, uh, PR, <laughs> PRA session tomorrow, but I'm going to tell you in detail. So, because government policy will affect you. How many of you have heard of uh, Secure Open Source uh, Software Act? Oh, some of you. Uh, actually, because it's a US law, so, uh, well, welcome to Euro Europe. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you know about it. So, next one. Have you heard of Europe, uh, European Union Cyber Resilience Act? Ooh, okay, more and more people. Of course, it's European. So, but how many of you know GDPR? <laughs> Woo! Well, actually, it's not that exciting because, um, yeah, uh, in open source, we have no geographical boundaries, so no matter where you came from, you may be from Europe, or maybe you are not from Europe, it will affect you. And government reg regulation, yeah, exactly, it will affect us. And uh, now we have the Cyber Resilient Act. So who is maintaining an open source software? Okay, some of you. And who is contributing to an open source software? More of you. Who is using an open source software almost every day? All of you, yes, great. So. Uh, European uh, Union Cyber Resilience Act is actually a regulation that's trying to keep us safe, like putting a, uh, you know, this logo on your software. But, um, yeah, so it's trying to protect people, but there's a, a problem that um, we are facing because we are open source. So open source, basically, who have seen this before? Yes. So, uh, you know those purple ones? You know, it's actually an updated version that I, I stole a slice from somebody. Um, so, uh, the purple version are those like, you know, they have some money because uh, they're uh, supported by some organization. Uh, the, the blue ones are probably like, uh, you know, a very rich company supporting them. But they are this little one that everybody uses, but they, they got no resources. Maybe one person like trying to maintain it during the weekend and something. So uh, we won't have enough resources to uh, demonstrate that the, the compliance of the project, or it will be very expensive, it's very difficult, and it will affect the ecosystem a lot if we have a cyber resilient act that trying to like, make you and me maybe reliable on the software that is open source. So uh, there is a non-commercial activity that is extended, but uh, there is a problem because a lot of open source projects, they need to have some support, they need to accept donation. Maybe there will be people who work for another company who contribute to the open source, is that okay? Or, you know, I know some project, you have been to the, the PyData booth, there's like some project supported by non-focus, is that okay? And all these complicated things that will make the term commercial very difficult to define. So, um, what shall I do? Uh, so, we have to get more information and voice out our concerns. That's why the CRA se uh, panel session tomorrow is designed for this and for you. Um, so this is actually what happened in Brussels uh, in May, but uh, this is in the past, so we will have an amazing one tomorrow. And one of the advisors will be here tomorrow, hopefully. Um, so, or if you want to come to the, the session and then uh, you, you know, want to get some background information before you come here, 
there is a lot of information in this slide, so that's why I would give you the link to, uh, you know, if you get this link, you will have access to this slide and you can read all these things before you come to the PRA session tomorrow. But even if you don't, it's fine. You can just come and ask questions. Uh, there will be people, uh, the leader from the community will be there. Uh, so, yeah, please join us tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Chef. Thank you. And now we have AWS, y, uh, AWS Lambda loves Python 3.11. Uh, let's see. By the way, I wanted to ask before, who's, a f who's this first zero Python for? Like, who is here for the first time? Wow, this is very good. Well, welcome. It's our pleasure to have you here. Nice. How are we? So Almost. <laughs> Be patient, just a second. This is quite a nice. Oh. I should, I should actually. Uh, so. <coughs> okay. Um, hello, my name is Jonas. I work at Otto. Um, it's a big e commerce uh, marketplace in Germany. But um, enough about that. I want to tell you why it's. Uh, a good idea to run a Python 3.11 if you are running code on AWS Lambda. Um, I expect that most of you are more or less familiar with AWS Lambda. Those who are not, it's a function as a service product sold by AWS. Um, yes. So, right to the chase, um, we switched uh, one of our functions from 3.10 to 3.11, and what you see here are screenshots from the switch. And um, you can see that our runtimes um, decreased in all categories. I don't have the screenshot from the max runtime here, but the average and the minimal, minimal runtime <coughs> both decreased, decreased by 10 to 20% just by switching the Python version. Um, yeah. So um, you might think, OK, but 3.10 is the latest version that is available on AWS Lambda. Well, you also uh, can build your own containers and run them. Um, we do it with uh, Docker and Terraform, but we do not, do not use Docker itself to build the container, but we use Nix to build a smaller container. And that also allows us to actually be confident in saying that the runtime improvement is uh, only responsible, uh, only Python version is responsible for the runtime improvement because we know exactly what our container contains. <clears throat> because uh, Nix allows us to build very small containers. Uh, all the system dependencies fit on this slide that are included in this container. Um, apart from glibc, I forgot to put it on. Um, so uh, everything stayed the same, uh, all dependencies stayed the same. Um, it's just the Python version that changed and that resulted in this uh, performance increase. And yeah, so it was basically uh, one character change in the yeah. pipeline and um, we saved money from it. And I think you can all benefit from this knowledge. And if you're interested in using Nix with Python, uh, just find me here or the next few days in the conference, maybe. I'm going to talk about this tomorrow again. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. Now we have VB joining us. Awesome. Um, yes. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, well, I can't see it. Oh, well. oh all right. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's joining us um, remotely, and also good evening to everyone over here. I am VB. I do a bunch of open source things at Hugging Face. Um, I'm also one of the organizers for this conference. Thank you so much for coming here, first of all. Um, uh, all right, so what I'm going to be talking about today is Llama 2. Who over here knows about Llama? Awesome. So Llama is this, um, um, is this 
research model that was released a um, couple months back by Facebook, uh, which was research access only, um, which could be used for um, all LLM things, large language model things. Um, so pretty much everything which Ines spoke about in her keynote. Thank you very much again for that. <laughs> and so uh, yesterday, um, they released Llama 2, uh, which is basically the successor for Llama. Now, what makes it interesting? Uh, so first of all, it was trained on much more data. So it was trained on 40% more data than Llama 1. So it essentially is a much more sort of powerful model. Second of all, they made it faster by using a specific type of attention called grouped query attention. Now, this was launched yesterday, and um, um, you know, Hugging Face being Hugging Face partnered with Meta to make sure that we can release the access for Llama 2 to everyone, right? Now, um, there are certain quirks with the license, but by and large, this model is an open access uh, model. You can talk about, like, we can talk about licenses outside, but anyone can access Llama 2. Uh, you can read more about like what, like how to use Llama 2 and so on. Um, um, you know, um, on this sort of blog post, um, it's, it's essentially hf.co slash Llama 2, and you and you find that. Um, what I'm gonna what I'm gonna show you is how can you actually run this Llama 2 model uh, on your MacBook, right? So we're gonna do a bunch of uh, hacky things. Um, what I did to in in order to do this, what I did was I essentially like hacked together two scripts. One is in case you're a, you're a, you're a Python enjoyer, <laughs> then you can essentially go to, um, go, go to the script. It's on web of S10 slash Llama Playground. You can use Llama 2 via the friendly transformers API. Um, and it works pretty much the same way as any uh, transformer model works. However, let's make it interesting and let's work, to, like let's make this work on, um, our MacBook using um, A and E. So I'm gonna like quickly bring this screen if I'm if I can. Or can I? Actually, I cannot. Well, that. Ooh. Ah. Can someone? Oh well, no. Do I have some some more time left? You have two minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! I can't. <laughs> Okay, we're gonna try again. Oh, all right, it appeared. So um, what I'm doing is I'm using llama.cpp, which is again another open source project, um, which allows you to run, um, you know, machine learning models, large language models on uh, MPS. Again, the script for that is on Web of S10 slash llama playground. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna essentially like run this, which takes a quantized model, and I'm gonna ask it something right now. Uh, um, write a joke for me, please. And let's see if it does something. I hope it performs okay. Uh, Oh my God, that's like really slow. But um, essentially what, what's happening right now is like it's, it's pulling a 13 b uh, billion parameter model all, um, and, um, all on my laptop and it's running it. And so here's one, sure, here's one. Why couldn't the bicycle stand up by itself? Because it was too tired. Oh, I am also too tired. Uh, get it, too tired, and well, what? Uh, <laughs> Anyway, so it did something. You can do the same thing. Thank you very much, and you have a great day. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, VB. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have August uh, with adding arrow function to Python grammar. I, I love that live talk. And congratulations on doing a live demo, by the way. <laughs> That is VB, everyone. So, how are we doing? <laughs> uh, uh, do I need to do something special, or uh, it should just connect, I right? I am going to. Maybe you have like a second. Um, yeah, I'm going to start running yeah. the timer. Yeah, please try. So, just click back. And quick. Wait, and now what do you think? Do you want me to bring this up? 
A few technical issues today. Oh. Okay, to that side. Okay, well. Um, <laughs> you okay. do have time. Uh, it will be. <laughs> Very hard to do from here. Uh, so what we are going to do is um, we will uh, change lambda um, expression uh, into our own function in C Python. Uh, we will try to do that. Uh, I hope I won't do something wrong here. Uh, I already uh, cloned uh, the C Python, um, and I'm going to first uh, show you how uh, lambda expression uh, works. Just to be sure, uh, this is how uh, it is, um, you know, uh, defined. And we will try to do something like uh, this, uh, right? Um, and it will work, this, it doesn't work right now. Uh, so what we are gonna do is we'll get into the grammar, uh, python.gram, then I will go to the lambda uh, keyword, then I will copy this, I will create my own uh, definition, uh, change its name, uh, then I will have, oh, uh, okay, this is harder than, <laughs> so, uh, I put my parentheses. I'm not using uh, lambda style uh, parameters. Uh, then I'm adding this and uh, put my arrow function, which means uh, that I will need to um, define in the tokens uh, also. Uh, but first, I will have to go to the lambda f and, uh, oops, the second one. Um, as you see, there is an expression definition here. And here, uh, I will put it uh, on top of um, this guy and add like arrow def, um, lamb arrow def, right? I hope it's correct. Um, vim. Then I will go to the uh, grammar again and I will get into the tokens and I will find the column where it is defined because we added something new actually here. Uh, I will just add another one, um, function sign, uh, which will be uh, arrow, Oop. then make a regen uh, token. Okay, I started uh, getting a little excited here. Uh, Oop. Um, make regen, uh, okay. All right, now uh, this works for <laughs> three minutes or something like that. Uh, I'm not so sure if you'll uh, work on time because uh, I started, <laughs> fingers started trembling here. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna show uh, something more. Uh, there are two things, one of them is the expression, the other one is statement. Statement is I am always. You don't know what to do with that, you just save it in your mind, right? Expression is like, uh, I give a cup to you, you can do anything with it. You can throw it, you can give it uh, to somebody else, it returns something. Uh, what is the difference? The difference is like, if I define a function, um, this is a statement, right? I can't do this. A equals, because it doesn't return anything. But lambda um, returns something, actually, right? It, it returns a function. Um, so it, it makes a kind of a difference. Uh, when we change uh, this into uh, this definition, um, it will uh, be kind of, I don't know, uh, it, it will seem uh, in a nice way. <laughs> and uh, we could uh, construct some stuff like X and Y, um, and Y, like this, and uh, then we could even change this into a function that returns a function, which um, adds X and Y, then we can call it, for example, 1.2, uh, then like this. It's just, experiences are nice, right? Like you can nest them inside, you can uh, merge them or something like that. Um, yes, okay, now uh, we will see if it worked. <laughs> uh, a plus B, whoop. okay, yeah, we have it. As you see, we changed the grammar. <laughs> so we can even do this, at that. Um, yeah, um, I'm gonna actually <laughs> Do even more um, from, <laughs> this will also work. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I got some help from Pablo today because apparently I put it into the wrong place. Uh, thanks to him also. Uh, thank you very much everybody.
Thank you, thank you. That was quite fun. Very, very fun. Awesome, so who has plans for dinner, actually? How are plans for dinner going? No one? Okay. No one's having dinner today. All right. <laughs> Everyone is there. Where? Oh, Kraka. What do they have there? Check food. Meat and potatoes. Okay, so vegetarians, that is not for you. Okay? <laughs> Maybe somewhere else? Awesome. Cool. Okay. Hi. My name is Yoni, and th this is just a funny thing that made me go, hmm. Uh, to be clear, it's, it was a bug in my code, not in Python's uh, list comprehensions. But you might be able to use this as an interview question or an obfuscation technique sometime. So here's the coding test. To be clear, this is not a trick question at all. The, the, this is sort of FizzBuzz level coding. So uh, the question is, we have a lookup dictionary from country codes, country names, okay? And then we have a list of data, which is supposed to include country codes, but it has some garbage uh, also. We want to filter just the items that are country codes, and we want to keep the country names uh, along. The, the, this should be simple. The, the, there should be nothing difficult about this. And here is a correct answer. The, the, this is what I intended to write. So. There's the lookup table, uh, there's a list comprehension which has eggs looping over the, the input list, well, which has garbage and a country code, and an, a condition if eggs in lookup, and if those match, if, if that matches, we return eggs and lookup of eggs. Right? This is what I intended to write. Uh, the bug was that I swapped eggs and the tuple. Okay, uh, so th this is clearly wrong, right? So uh, who thinks this is a syntax error? A few hands. Who thinks it's a value error? A few hands. Who thinks it's a key error? More hands. You're kind of closer. Who thinks it's no error at all? Several hands. Uh, you're correct. There, there's no error. This is entirely valid code. Uh, <laughs> so, um, what was the what's the value of result? Sorry, uh, uh, in the lookup dictionary, there's a Yeah, 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 uh, okay, yeah. So the, the result um, is A, B, C, D, which uh, are not country codes as far as I know, and we're not even in the input list. <laughs> uh, okay, so. Uh, the, the next, next question is well, what else happened, but you, you answered it already. Uh, well, what happened was that I modified my lookup dictionary. Uh, for those of you who are not yet laughing, uh, maybe I'll explain it. Uh, <laughs> so the, there are, uh, I'm looping over a list of strings. Uh, and assigning each string to a tuple of two elements. And each string happens to be two characters long. Uh, in Python, if you loop over a string, you loop over the, not really characters, the single character substrings. So uh, when I assign x and look up x to a, b, I assign a to x and b to look up of x. So uh, when you want to give a weird interview question to your candidates, here's, here's one um, example. And uh, maybe if you want to <laughs> remember something from this, uh, there, there was a tweet by Ned Batchelder saying, hey, you can uh, 
assign to anything you want in a list comprehension. This is a much more useful thing to do than mine. Thank you. Thank you. So next now, we have Antonio Curry with Spy. I'm very curious about this one. Okay. What well, well, I'm supposed to... So I'm talking about spy. So the first question, how many of you use type annotations in your Python code? How many of you would like your Python code to go faster? <laughs> Thank you. I mean, if nobody uh, raised the hand now, it's a bit. So spy is a new project which I started a few weeks ago. It's brand new. Uh, I'm doing it as part of my job at Anaconda in the PyScript team. It's static Python. So it's, it means to be a new implementation of a compiler and an interpreter that aims to be as fast as C and as Pythonic as Python. Uh, the first goal for us is to target WebAssembly because of PyScript, and uh, this is the GitHub repo, and uh, I would like Spy to be really a first-class WebAssembly language which use all the features which are coming in the WebAssembly world. Uh, we can argue whether this is a subset of Python which is statically com typed and compiled, or it's a different language which is Python-like, I don't think it's the, the, the distinction is too much important. It's more a marketing thing. But yeah, I think it's a different language. But uh, you can pretend that it's just Python. Some of the goals for the project. I want this to feel like Python. So for most people who don't know all the details or the corner cases of the language, maybe you, you don't even notice that uh, they are different. So for, and for example, I want to have a fast edit run cycle. So you can just modify your code and, um, and run it without having to recompile. And that's why I'm developing an interpreter and a compiler at the same time, and I'm testing uh, to, to them to be 100% compatible so that you can just switch from one to the other. Non-goals, I don't plan, I don't try, don't even try to be 100% compatible with CPython in all corner cases because I I've tried to optimize Python for 20 years, and I know it's, it, it, it's, it's hard. So I'm basically, I'm, uh, I'm, trying, I'm cheating and removing some of the rules. For this reason, I, I don't plan that people who use .py files, they use .spy, just to underline that we have different rules. Uh, yeah, the idea is that you should be able to use, uh, to create standalone executable that you can just distribute and execute without having the interpreter. Uh, you, can, you should be able to use Spy for creating a CPython or other, or PyPy or GraphPy extensions. So in this sense, you can use it as a, instead of Cyton or a better Cyton, now Stefan is in first row and is look, looking bad at me. <laughs> but yes, uh, I plan to have a first class integration with C libraries, uh, but also with other Python libraries by embedding C Python, so you will be able to use Python uh, modules from Spy. But also, since I'm tar targeting WebAssembly, you will have full first class integration with JavaScript and all the browser APIs. In the first slide, I said that I wanted to feel like Python, but a statically typed language cannot feel like Python because we are too used to all the magic that Python can do. And if you don't use the magic by yourself, the library that you're using are doing the, using this magic. Uh, but the, real, the, the insight is that I think that the vast majority of magic happens at import time when all meta classes, decorators, and all these powerful libraries do stuff. And then the language that you use normally, it's actually pretty boring and static. And we tell people, oh, you should not mix types, you should use step annotation, you not, don't monkey patch things, don't uh, exec, don't create classes at runtime. So if we stick to this, then this is very easy to compile. So the idea is that with Spy, we just codify this pattern at there will be an explicit metaprogramming phase in which you have full power of the interpreter and your libraries will be able to do 
all the magic that they, are, they do, but then we draw a line and from there you are no longer, no longer allowed to, for example, monkey patch classes and do things like this so that the compiler have a better and easier job to emit fast code. Uh, it's almost bubbleware so far. I started a few weeks ago, so right now I have a very boring language in which you have, can do computation. I can compile Fibonacci, yes. And uh, uh, I plan to add a JavaScript integration very soon and to, so that I can translate to Wasm running in the browser and do interesting stuff already. Then I will add all the other things like lists and dictionaries, classes. And then at the second stage, I will add the metaprogramming features, but they are there. Like I, I'm designing the thing for, for having this. Uh, that's it. Thank you. So next now, we have learning Python through blocks. We had it. We don't have it anymore. We have it again. Okay, good to go. Okay, so in this talk I want to put the spotlight on Python in education, um, how kids learn how to code with Python, and how we can all help. So my name is Josh, I'm a software engineer at Anaconda, uh, and my full-time job is working on Edublox, which is a project I created when I was 12, when I was a student. So how to learn Python if you're a complete beginner as a kid? Uh, so the most typical thing you're probably going to do is go to Google, type in how to download Python, and it might tell you that it's already pre-installed or give you a guide of how to install it. And then once you kind of got to that point, you probably end up with something that looks like this, which is a Python text prompt that we're probably all familiar with. But for kids, this kind of presents a problem which I kind of call the, the blank canvas of it's not very kind of obvious where to start. You kind of just thrown into the text prompt and what do I type? And this is a very unfamiliar concept to kids. You know, they've never typed a line of code in their life. So, you know, they're, they're not really kind of sure what to do with this blank canvas and text prompt. And this can kind of become a demoralizing experience that leads kids just to give up. And that's not really what we want because we kind of have a digital skills shortage and you know, we want more kids to, to learn Python and, and coding. So just to kind of give a bit of background for those who aren't familiar, uh, this is Scratch. So this is kind of like the most popular tool that kids learn um, how to code at a very basic level. So Scratch doesn't necessarily teach the concepts of text-based programming, but teaches fundamental concepts like for loops, iteration, um, and all of that kind of stuff that you need to know, variables, functions. Um, and all the blocks are kind of presented to the user so they can see what they need to do and they can drag and drop and experiment and you can't really get anything wrong. There's no concept of errors, um, there's debugging but not in the sense of it's giving me a block of red text and I need to find out what to do with it. So one of the solutions that I have come up with um, is kind of introducing this block-based format back um, and this is through Edublox. And essentially what I've done is I've put the Python text on the blocks so that there's a one-to-one -one mapping between one line of text and a block. So the kids can kind of have that familiar environment of this block-based colorful environment, but they're starting to get too used to the syntax and how Python works, uh, which is really important. And I've tried to include fun libraries like Turtle, so being able to make it fun and engaging rather than just print hello world. Um, but these are libraries that can be used outside of Edublox. So eventually, Edublox isn't going to be used by these kids. They'll move on to text-based Python, uh, but we're teaching the concepts that they can later apply uh, when they get to that stage. And very similar to Scratch, you have everything kind of on the canvas that you can drag and drop, um, and example projects to load up um, kind of tutorials of how to use common things. So kind of what I want to get out of this talk is kind of just to 
get across some of the things that have been key considerations for me, and hopefully we can all apply to the stuff that we're building to help beginners, uh, specifically kids. So especially in the UK where I'm from, and it's mostly a worldwide problem, there is a lack of teacher training. Um, teachers don't know how to, to code very well, and that's through no fault of their own. Uh, this is just through kind of having not, having not the training in place to be able to deliver the lessons that they need. Uh, touch screen devices are a problem. I, I ran a code club and I had one kid ask what a keyboard and a mouse was, um, and using Python, there's a bit of a problem. And also, there is a problem of text-based programming just being scary. Um, you know, it's a big shift from the block-based environment of Scratch that I show you to a text-based prompt, um, and that is kind of like the, the jump, going in between one and the other uh, within a matter of a, a few months within school. And also, installing pro uh, software in school is a big problem as well. Um, but there is a solution to that, which is browsers. If you're in the WebAssembly Summit yesterday, we were talking about bringing Python to the browser. PyScript is an open source project uh, that is being worked on at the minute to make it super easy to get started with, with Python in the browser. And this is something that I want to implement. And also, kind of just another example of adding more fun kind of libraries. Uh, this is based off a Scratch extension that I saw, which brings Spotify into Python to be able to play preview songs. Uh, so it's kind of just adding another fun element into the learning to t code with text process. So it's completely free, and that's really important that it's free. So if you'd like to try it out, there are the links, and um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think uh, we're, we're getting to our last talk of the day, our last lightning talk. I don't know who's coming up, so it's a surprise for me too. Let's see. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I unmask. So while he sets up, I actually found a joke because I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the silence. Uh, so uh, it's a pie joke joke. So why did the programmer quit his job? Anyone? Because he didn't get a raise. <laughs> I, I didn't say it was a great joke, but. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. So we're ready to start. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You go. Okay, so I wanted to talk to you about uh, the 25 years of open source because I don't see anybody s celebrating that this year and this year we are having 25 years of open source software. <laughs> so you must be thinking he must be wrong, right? People have, like programmers have shared source uh, since times immemorial. What is he talking about? It's almost like 100 years at least, right? But turns out that uh, that guy whose name is on every computer book created a, a 25 years ago created a, a conference where the, a lot of uh, open source developers congregated and they, they decided to name this phenomenon open source software before that it didn't have a name. And they decided to do, this is, this is uh, a uh, screenshot from, from a, a description of that event, written by some guy called Guido Van Rossum or something. I don't know if you know him. Uh, so yeah, so, so they just decided to do it to uh, like help businesses realize that there is this, there is this all, all, all that free code floating around that they can use in the business area. And uh, after 25 years of that, we can re-evaluate the effects. Like the, the largest, most uh, rich companies in the world had made billions on this open source software, right? Uh, every large open source uh, project has a foundation behind it, so the companies can influence the development without having to employ programmers. We have developed uh, marvelous processes and tools for making software more uh, like a shiny product. 
that, that uh, it's ready to be sold to customers and packaged. And uh, unfortunately, there, there are some downsides as well. As, as we use uh, all this work, this effort to package it, it also gets into, uh, in the works uh, a little bit and, and uh, makes everything a little bit slower, a little bit bigger, a little bit uh, you know, less portable. So we, we built this magnificent machine, but we are left with all this craft that was there because it was a product. Uh, also, it takes effort, right, uh, to, to do the packaging, to do the CI, to do the uh, proper, you know, type annotations, everything. Uh, and sometimes this affects uh, open source developers uh, in bad ways. They, they drop out uh, or, or go crazy or, you know, some of them died. So I'm thinking, you know, maybe the, those companies could do that work themselves and let's do more open source code and not open source software for ourselves within the community. And we don't, like, not every single open source uh, project has to be a shiny product at the end. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So that was our last talk for today. Uh, I want to thank each and every single one of you for coming here today, for helping us make this a party. Uh, and well, you're free to go for dinner, and the party continues tomorrow. Thanks again. <laughs> <laughs>